So just a reminder that this um, will be recorded just as the previous three have been. And if you've missed any of those, uh, they are available on the Shul's YouTube site. Feel free to uh, watch them at your leisure. <clears throat> so tonight's the last of our four-part series. In the first three, we have discussed and to some degree delved into a number of the key moments, key events, and key ideas that helped shape and to some degree reshape the religious lives, the religious world of Eastern European Jewry over the course of the second half of the 18th and the 19th century. Well, as we pointed out at the very beginning of our lecture series, and again, to some degree at the end last time, that is true at least for half of the Eastern European Jewish population. That is, as we noted at the very outset, it's not uncommon that when we say the words chasidim, or we say the words even misnagdim, that the image that we conjure in our own minds is an image of men. It, so much of what we associate with these movements is about the lives and the religious lives of the men who were part of them. And so, I always find it interesting to ask the question, well, what exactly was the impact on the lives of women? And for the purposes of this evening's lecture, we're gonna focus on two different sets of ideas. We're going to talk about the world of Hasidus and the rise of Hasidim and its spread, which largely happens in the middle of the 19th century, as we discussed, um, at two lectures ago. And we're also going to talk about the rise of what is known as the yeshiva movement. The yeshiva movement we've discussed less, but the yeshiva movement is what happens in the wake of the death of the Vilna Gon. We talked about Chaim of Belajan and his establishment of the first, what is known as a modern yeshiva, not modern the way we use it in, in, our, in our contemporary parlance, but modern and that it differed quite a bit from the yeshivos that had been uh, um, uh, prior to it. He founded it in 1803 in uh, the Eitz Chaim Yeshiva in the town of Volazhin. It was followed in 1815 by the founding of a similar type of yeshiva in Mir and many more which will follow uh, in their footsteps again over the course of the 19th century. So our question for today is what is the impact of these two sets of ideas, these two loosely called movements that are capturing the hearts and minds of much of Eastern European Jewry over the course of the 19th century, what impact does it have on the women? And when we ask this question, I want us to think about it on two different levels or two different planes. I want to think about this question from uh, the perspective of theory, meaning let's take the key ideas of each of these movements and let's ask ourselves, how might we expect these ideas to impact and shape the lives of women. And then let's look at the practice. Let's look at what actually happens. What the historical record tells us of the ways in which these ideas impact and shape the lives of real women living in the course of the 19th century. <clears throat> so let's begin in the world of the Hasidim. As we spoke about in our second lecture, Hasidus is not one thing. It certainly isn't one thing today, and it wasn't even quite early on in the history of the Hasidic movement. It is many different things with many different ways of expressing itself, but at the end of the day, there are some central ideas that really do bring much of the Hasidic world together to unify it in sort of a core, basic, foundational ideology. And key to that um, set of ideas is the idea of Devegas. The idea that the ultimate end of all religious experience is a cleaving to God. Devegas means to cleave to God, to stick to him to experience a connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This um, a collection, Kesar Shem Tov, is one of the earliest collections of um, uh, the Baal Shem Tov's writing in early Hasidus, um, in which 
it is described that Sibat Amitia Hachayos Kumad Vegas. The the essence, the true purpose of life, not just religious practice, but life is about the Vegas, is about creating a connection with our creator. Because God himself is life. God is the essence of all life. So when you connect to God, you're actually living. And when you aren't connected to God, you're you're chayim in mikra. You're 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 living almost an accidental, incidental life. It's not real living. Real life to live life as it was intended to be lived is to feel that connection to one's creator. And as we saw last time as well, even practices which are fundamental to traditional Jewish life, like tefillah and Talmud Torah. In the world of Hasidus, they become a means toward a greater end. And not perhaps the ends that we might traditionally have associated with things like tefillah. The purpose of tefillah is not to get what you ask for. It's not even to fulfill the mitzvah of tefillah. The purpose of tefillah is tveikus. It's to, to establish a connection with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. The same thing is true about Talmud Torah. Hey, ta- the purpose of Talmud Torah is not to educate yourself. Granted, that's important, and, and Hasidim will tell you that's important too, but that's not really why we engage in Talmud Torah. It's not about educating yourself about what to do and what not to do, and it's not about fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. It's because the process, the experience of Talmud Torah should bring you to a different spiritual plane where you're actually connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Um, so he says, the female developing more. This is from the um uh, the Totos Yaakov Yosef, the great student of the best of Yaakov Yosef in Palanoi, right? That he heard from his teacher, the best Ika Insect Torah Utila, who should get back an absolute el premius, ruchnius, or in song shabbatot ultimate tatora that fila. Shahu nikra limud lishma. The purpose of dav of davening and of learning is not what you understand from the words that are there. It's to what degree are you connecting with the letters, with the God's presence, the Ein Sof, the ultimate presence of God, which is hidden within and contained within those letters. And that, that kind of learning is called limud lishma. Limud for the sake of God, or perhaps even God's names which are contained within the texts that we study. So, we saw two lectures ago that this idea of Dveikus as penetrating in all experience of religious life, as being the ultimate end of all religious life, also means that in the Hasidic world, it's not just Torah and Tefillah, but there are many other things that one can use in order to establish that kind of connection to God. There are other mitzvot that may bring you to this state of Dveikos. We even talked about avola shebegashmios, ways of using the physical world, song and laughter, and perhaps drink, right, as ways of connecting to that higher spiritual plane. So let me ask you, what do you think in theory the impact of this idea would be on the lives of women. Hmm. I don't know. Some women like to drink too. <laughs> what do you think? But where, so where are you going with that? What? Well, it's more of a separation. The men would be dancing with all together. And Ooh, the I think we're in the world of practice already. Somebody knows a little too much about that world. Tell me the theory. What might we have thought? What, what might this idea have done for the religious lives of women? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, right? There's, there, there is certainly room to make an argument here, right? That the idea of Dveikus as the ultimate ends of all religious experience is something that would actually open the religious world more to women. We got, I got, I got, I'm shaking the head up here. No, what? All right. Hold on, right? But the uh, conceptually speaking, one doesn't have, like you said, one doesn't have to go to yeshiva in order to establish this. You don't have to know, right? You don't have to know several mesechtos of Gemara in order to achieve dveikos, right? It's something that can happen through a whole variety of different means. Right? It was perhaps something that we might have thought would open the world of religious experience perhaps even more to women than it had been previously. Lenny, what are you going to say? This is so antithetical to almost everything else that they teach you. And they can always do small soaps and they'll have a good deal of dirt. It's, it's, not, it's not our religion. Our religion is precisely about doing. Okay. It's, you learn for the purpose of teaching and for the purpose of doing, not for the purpose of getting a heart. We're not gonna we're not gonna pass judgment here, uh, and and we're and we're also I don't want, I also don't want us to get a little bit um, uh, you know off focus from the world the impact of, on on the world of women. Yeah. Not everybody oh, the males also go to uh, the Jesus, and so maybe it opened the doors for them too. Oh, for sure, right? That for sure it did, right? Hasidus offered an avenue for men who were not necessarily men who sat in the yeshiva, right? That to, to participate in ways that they couldn't previously. And again, in theory, in theory, perhaps we might've thought that this opened the world for women as well. This is a, uh, from a blog post back in uh, 2010. Um, a rather a, a blog really about academic Jewish studies it's called On the Main Line, a fascinating fascinating blog. Um, and he writes here, he quotes an interesting footnote that he found in this book on Hilfos Tzfilin that was published in 1883, in which it says, <laughs> I, the author, remember that in White Russia, where I grew up, there was a young woman, a miracle worker, who was thought to be in the via. She would put on tefillin every day, not just one pair, but two. And the tzaddikim didn't protest. However, I forgot her name and the city since I was a small child. <laughs> so this blog suggests that that historians have seen this and said this must be a reference to a woman who is known as the Ludmir Moid, the maiden of Ludmir, a woman by the name of Hannah Rachel Verbenhofer, um, who, exactly as we just described a moment ago, was a woman who was quite capable of achieving states of Devekus. And she seems to actually have practiced as because she was really good at achieving states of the vacas. Now, lest you think this is some sort of academic, right? Only the academics are interested, right? In this um, uh, Rachel, um, uh, ver, in Hannah Rachel ver, 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 Rachel. This is a this is a different kind of publication, right? Um, three years later, 2013, a whole feature article on her in Mishpacha magazine. It starts like this on. Um, uh, um, uh, in June 11, 2004, I come up from a table. Oh, sorry, um, yeah, took place on higher things. See what the newly discovered British French state of Hanara for verbal mother. It was the 116th judge of the Ludmir Moyne, the maiden of Ludmir, who was also known. The story of the only Hasidisha female who behaved like a rebel, fearing Tish, accepting Fitlach, and performing miracles. But but didn't belong to any of the Hasidic dynasties, has generated many articles, books, and plays in countries around the world. For these many accounts, it is possible to piece together a picture of one of the most fascinating lives of the last century. Yes. Again, the, 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 the Yiddish seems to be moist, right? So, but whoever called that in English, 
Yeah. Well, yes, yes. Um, her story goes something like this. She does seem to have gathered quite a, a following around her. There is word that she did have kind of the, the Haskamos of some significant Rabbanim. I think the Chernobyl are amongst them. Um, but eventually, it, she, she was not married. She was not married when she served in this capacity. Ultimately, um, you know, stories, there are different stories, but probably forced to marry. Um, and then some of her gifts die down later in life. Um, but lots of mystery around the Ludmir Moid. But the theory that this is something that women could do right, just as well as men is something that, that seems to at least have been played out in one case, but the reality, of course, is not like this. <laughs> this was an exceptional case, fascinating as it was. And the reason why, the reason why this isn't the way things generally played out is largely because of the role that the Rebbe, or the initially known as the Tzaddik, is going to play from very early on in the world of Hasidus. As we described um, two lectures ago, the theory goes something like this. The idea is to connect, right? To create, have this Dvekas experience. But there's also a recognition early on, we even saw it hinted at in the writings of the Besh that we looked at two, two, um, two lectures ago. It's very hard to achieve that connection to achieve Dvekas. It's very hard to be there on a constant level. And for many people, it's hard ever to achieve that kind of spiritual state. And so very early on, part of the ideas that emerged in Hasidus is that if I cannot achieve Dvekos myself, I can latch myself on to somebody who can. Somebody who is going to look out for me. Somebody who is going to daven for me. Remember how we saw the Besht himself up in Shemaim arguing on behalf of the Jewish people? It, I, I can't do it. At least I can connect myself to someone who can. And even if I can and am capable, somebody who is truly capable, somebody who spends more of his time in this state of Dvekos is somebody who can achieve more than I can. And perhaps he can achieve on my behalf as well. So the idea of a tzaddik that I will cling to, who then clings to God on my behalf, becomes critical to the idea of, of Hasidus very early on. As we saw this map, a two lectures ago, this map shows you each red square is where there is a, a court of some of, of a tzaddik. One, you know, a small square is just one. The largest are, are five different tzaddikim who were active in that area in this period from 1815 to the 1860s. So very early on, Hasidus becomes about attaching myself to a Rebbe, and with the exception of the Ludmir Moid, these were met. Right? And to establish that kind of personal connection to a rabbi, to a, to a male, to a man, was not something that was very easy or very common for women to do. Now let's Let's take a closer look right, at what this, what this looks like. So imagine for a moment that uh, you are a young man living in the city of Gare. And um, uh, let's imagine that, you, that, uh, that a shidduch has been arranged for you to a wonderful woman from uh, the town of Chernobyl. Now, in most cases, mostly not all, but in most cases, Right, what would happen after a shidduch was made and a, and, and a husband and wife were married where, and they were from different towns? Where would they go? To the town of the wife, right? To the town of the wife. Yes, right? So the, in most cases, okay, not all, but in most cases, so this young man from Gare is going to move in. Right, um, uh, if he can arrange it in, actually in the house of his in-laws, um, uh, for a period of a few years right, until he's out on his, ready to go out on his own, he's gonna to move to Chernobyl. Now, assuming that this man grows up as a follower of a, the Gera Rebbe, now he lives in Chernobyl. There's a Chernobyl or Tzadik also, what's he gonna do? Uh, okay, good, right? Open a whole thing, yeah. Right? So, so what, is he gonna become a Chernobyl, Chernobyl or Chassan? Probably not. Right? In all likelihood, he is going to remain loyal to, to Ger. Right? Now, how does he do that? How does one show their identity 
as a ger chassid living in Chernobyl. Oh, okay, very good. So I'm going to continue to dress like they do in ger when I'm in Chernobyl. If I can find nine other men, nine other ger chassidim in Chernobyl, what am I going to do? I'm going to open a shtibel. Right? I'm going to open a ger shtibel in, in Chernobyl. Absolutely. And I'm also going to do my best at least at some point over the course of the year to do what? To go back, right? To make a pilgrimage back to Ger to connect in person with the Rebbe. And of course, similarly to at the rest of Europe. So if I am from one past, but I'm currently living in Bells, so at some point, and either because I got married to somebody there or because business took me there, I am at some point going to try to come back right, to, to Munkach and, and reconnect with the Rebbe. And if I'm from Munkach, or if I'm from, from um, Kutsk, but I'm now living in Munkach, right? I'm going to leave Munkach and I'm going to try to go to Kutsk in order to connect with my Rebbe. To the point where at certain points, or one point in particular over the course of the year, at what point was this most popular? Good, around the Omnino Rhyme, around Rosh Hashanah. So the last few weeks of the summer, Right? And into the into on the last few weeks of El, into Tishrei, you would find Hasidim crisscrossing, crisscrossing Poland, right? And in Lithuania, this is what you did. You were each one going to visit their Rebbe. Now, who benefited from it? And how was this so made as easy and as um, uh, practical as it was? Remember this? Ah, the innkeeper. Remember the statistic we put up? In the first lecture, if you remember this, I'd be really impressed. <laughs> Say it again. Very good. 85, we estimates are about 85% of the taverns in what were Poland and Lithuania were run by Jews. Right? Were run by Jews. Huh? Owned by the Jews. Yeah. Right. So now this in this particular, in this particular um uh, painting. So this is what we, we mentioned last time. This was the non-Jew, right? Because clearly these were aimed at non-Jews for sure. Non-Jews would come in and get a drink right, at a Jewish tavern. But in, during this time of year, right, this was critical to creating this travel network that so Jews could go from place to place to have a place to sleep, a place to eat. And what would happen when they would sit down and drink, by the way? They would, they would talk Torah, sure. And what else would they talk about? The Rebbe? Right, and I would tell you a story about my Rebbe, and you would tell me a story about your Rebbe, and I tell you why 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 my Rebbe is greater than your Rebbe, and you tell me why your Rebbe is greater than my Rebbe, and the whole idea of a Hasidic tale is born right out of the Jewish taverns as Hasidim are crisscrossing throughout throughout Europe. I think a singer captures this in a passage that he puts in the mouth of an older Hasid um, that he describes as follows. I'm starting. What do you youngsters know? Rabbi Moshe showed his irritation with my father. You are children, mere school children. You missed it all. Is this what you call a generation? Boys, only boys. Are there today any two Hasidim? You sit in a train and ride to the rabbi. What art is there in that? In my days, we went on foot. If you wanted to reach Kuzmir for Rosh Hashanah, you left home right after the Shabbos following Tishabov. You went from inn to inn and drank a toast in each. The journey there was a great event in itself. We walked through the fields and sang Kuzmir melodies. Sometimes we spent the night in the woods. In one tavern, they used to keep a keg of brandy in the main room. There was a straw stuck in the keg, and whoever came in took a sip. To the side, there was some cold veal, and everyone had a bite. Hasidim from every town and city met together and talked for days. When older Hasidim talked in those days, the young fellow did not dare to interrupt. Now every snot nose has something to say. There was a time when if a young fellow was insolent, they held him on a wooden bench and gave him a thrashing. And afterwards, he had to treat the entire company to drinks. Approaching within a few miles of Kuzmir, one could already feel sanctity in the air. We began to dance and danced our way into Kuzmir. Who's not here? Okay. Now, my grandmother, actually remembers her mother going with her father to the Rebbe, meaning she being the oldest of, I believe, five siblings, was left to make yontis. Mm. Wow. Now, she would do it together, I believe, with an aunt. Yeah. Um, 
but she wouldn't, she would make out to if her parents would go. In most cases, that wasn't the case. These were the men who would go. So let's ask the question again. What was the impact on women? Nothing? Well, I don't think, it, I wouldn't call it nothing. Okay, they have more responsibility. What other types of responsibility might they have now that their husband may be gone from Shabbos Nachamu until Parnassah? Who is keeping the shop? Right? These men are not working remotely from their laptops, right? Huh? Oh, this is true in the Lutheran world. Though. Okay. I love it. I love it when we have people who can tell me as it was. Yes, we're getting there. Okay, so good. So good. So this, so part of, part of the impact, right, part of the impact here was certainly the fact that men were, would be gone for long periods of time, which makes the women not only the... Um, the ones responsible for the home, but the key breadwinners as well. Now, to be clear, right, there were other roles for women in the Hasidic world. So if we talked about dress for the men, sometimes there was, that was important for the women as well, to dress as you would in Ger or in Munkach in order to keep that identity. There were recipes right, that were key or core to a particular type of, of Hasidim. And, and certainly women would send notes Right, back and forth to, to the Rebbe. And there were even some cases where the Rebbe Tzin was, um, would see women in a particular Hasidic court. But for the most part, the religious experience that emerges in the 19th century around Hasidus was something that excluded the women. The women were not part of that. And we don't even have good evidence that the ideas behind Hasidus make their way into the religious world of Hasidic women. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. We'll get there, great, we'll get there. Good. <laughs> um, so you can you see the mother is, right? The daughters are less so. This was not, this was not uncommon by the second half by the time you have photography, we're already talking about the second half of the 19th century, mm -hmm. right? And so this would not be an uncommon, an uncommon scene, right? By the, the second half of the 19th century. Um, almost all the pictures that you're going to see today come are accessible online through Yivo's various collections that they have. Um, mm -hmm. They have on. Oh. Let's move to the world of the Mishnah. And again, when I talk about the world of the Misnagdim here, I, I hesitate a little bit to use that term. Um, what we really mean is the, the, the world of the yeshivos. Um, misnagdim is a term that um, you know, was used perhaps, per, you know, it, perhaps it's accurate in the late 18th century, earliest um, years of the 19th century. But after that, it, it really, I don't think it accurately portrays the yeshiva world, the yeshiva world didn't see themselves as actively anti-Hasidus. That really wasn't, that was no longer their battle. By the time we get into the middle of the 19th century, they have a, they're, they're doing something very different, right? They have a very different cultural, very different set of ideals, right? But, but it, isn't, it isn't fueled by a sense of being misnage, of, being, of opposing, right? As we, the, the term before, before was used, the Litvisha world, right? And perhaps that is, that's a better, that's a better descriptor than to call them to call them the snagdim. Fifty years ago, if the Litvish wanted to marry a Hasidic, mm. uh, depends when and, and and depends where. But but you're right. In certain families, that would certainly still be okay. So what? Let's talk about the let's talk about the world of the of, of, um, uh, the yeshiva for a moment. So the world of the yeshiva is animated. If there's one core idea in Hasidus being the Vekos, the core idea. In the world of the of, of the yeshivos is the idea of Torah lishma. Interestingly, an idea that we saw written in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, right, just a few moments ago. But the idea of Torah lishma is expounded and expanded upon um, most famously in this work um, of Rechaim of Balaj and his Nefesh Achaim. This comes from his work um, Ruach Chaim, and which he describes the term. Lishma. What does it mean to learn Torah? Lishma. The Yisvayer od inyan lishma l'shem Torah al derech masha. What does it mean to learn Torah lishma for its name or for its sake? It means for the sake of Torah. Torah needs us 
to learn it. And he'll describe how with a muscle. So before we get to the muscle, to truly understand the muscle, does everybody remember this picture? Right? Okay, good. So you'll remember then the world of Poland and Lithuania was rich in resources, right? um, and uh, particularly forests right? um, and rivers were, were commonplace in the world that we're describing. So good, let's get back then to the writing of the time of the legend. So it's like a, a raft that people would make um, uh, and which a person would get on to steer. In other words, so you're in the lumber trade. How do you transport lumber? Down the river, right? You tie these trunks together, right? And you float them as a raft down a river and a person gets on or people get on these to steer it to make sure it gets to the right place. Well, that's the mushal that time of legend is using. When it gets to the right place, it gets taken out of the water and then it gets brought to a mill, right? Where it's produced into whatever it is that you're trying to make out of the wood. So, says when when a person is on that raft so the person is being saved his own life is being saved from the water beneath and the the logs themselves the wood itself is being brought to its purpose he says, listen, if the person jumps off the raft, if the person doesn't steer the raft, two bad things are going to happen. The person's going to die because they're going to drown in the water. And the wood is never going to become what the wood was intended to become. It's the same thing with Torah. What's, what's the Torah in the mashal? The raft, the wood, right? Same thing with Torah. We, the Torah keeps us alive by us staying on the raft, by us learning Torah, it keeps us alive. And the Torah itself achieves what it was supposed to achieve by the act of us learning it. So Torah Lishma is the concept that the very act of study, the act of Talmud Torah, and here too, quite separate from the degree to which you're learning this halacha or that halacha, here the concept isn't the act of Talmud Torah leads me to some higher spiritual plane or some connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But the act itself is so significant. It's what the Torah was created for. It was created to be studied. And if we don't study the Torah, the Torah itself is at risk. We're at risk. The world is at risk. And the Torah itself is at risk. So the act of Talmud Torah becomes the preeminent act in all of Judaism. There is nothing more important than sitting with the Sefer and learning it in the world of the Litvisha world in the 19th century. So let's pause here and let me ask you, what do you imagine the impact of this idea becoming so amplified and so central might be on the lives of women. They're all with their children and? Okay. At okay. Okay, so what I'm hearing are varieties on the same theme, which are, this is probably not going to be right an idea that is welcoming in right or or an idea that would open itself to to the world of women 
So this is Rabbi Baruch Halevi Epstein, known best for his perush on Chumash, known as the Torah Tamima. Uh, Baruch Halevi Epstein also wrote a four-volume work called Mikor Baruch. He also wrote many other perushim. But he wrote a four-volume work um, uh, called Mikor Baruch, which is a series of, um, it, it, it's not quite a memoir, it's a series of, of, of um, memories he has um, uh, vignettes that he is recording primarily about his father, Rav Yechiel Michal Levi Epstein, author of the Arach HaShulchan, and his uncle, the Nitziv, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda, Berlin. And in fact, a piece of this four-volume work about his uncle, the Nitziv, was Public was translated into English and published by Art Scroll, I believe, um, in 1988. Um, some of you may know the story that uh, the Lakewood Cheder decided to send this book out as a um, as a fundraiser, sent it out far and wide, um, and then a few weeks later, to the same mailing list, they sent a letter that asked you please not to read this book. Right, discard it because there are pieces in it that are do not reflect the hashkafos of the nitziv. Um, now, Baruch Halevi Epstein writes his book Mokor Baruch. Right, the translators call it my uncle the nitziv because the nitziv was indeed Baruch Halevi Epstein's uncle. Now, he actually they actually could have just as easily have called it my brother-in-law the nitziv. So for those who are really fascinated by these kinds of things, um, let me show you how that works. If you don't, this is a good time to space out. I'll wake you up when we're done. Right? So here are three prominent families in the world of early 19th century right? um, uh, Lithuania. We'll start with the one on the left. Right? We've talked about Rabbi Chaim of Volodzhin, the founder of the yeshiva in Volodzhin, great Talmud of, of the Vilna Gaon. He founds the yeshiva in Volodzhin. When he passes away, his son, Rav Itzala of Volodzhin, takes over after him. Rav Itzala of Volodzhin has daughters, among, does not have a son. Amongst his daughters is a woman by the name of Reina Batya. I gave her the last name of Volodzhin because she didn't have another one. Right? That's um, uh, the Volodziner family. The second family is a family that emerges from a very successful merchant in the town of Mir, by the name of Yaakov Berlin, who marries a woman by the name of Bacha, Miriam Berlin, and they have nine children. Is it nine? Nine. Um, uh, amongst those nine children is Naftali Tzvi. Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, at the tender age of 13, is engaged to marry. The, do the daughter of Rav Itzala of Volodzhin, Reina Bacha of Volodzhin, they get married. Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin has a sister named Michla Berlin. Michla Berlin is married to Rabbi Yechiel Michal Halevi Epstein, the author of the Arach HaShulchan. That makes right, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin and Rabbi Yechiel Michal Halevi Epstein what? Brothers-in-law, fantastic. Rabbi Yechiel Michal Levi Epstein and Michla Berlin, they have how many? Seven kids? Seven kids. Amongst their kids is Baruch Halevi Epstein, which makes Rabbi Yechiel Michal Berlin what to Baruch Halevi Epstein? His uncle, my uncle the Nitziv. The story continues, though, because Rabbi Bacha of Elijah ultimately passes away. Rabbi Yechiel Michal Berlin marries his niece. The daughter of Rashiel Michal Halevi Epstein and Michal Berlin, and the sister of Rabbi Baruch Halevi Epstein, which makes Rabbi Nafali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin the brother in law of the Torah Tamima. Good. I'll test you on that later. <laughs> so, back to our story. This portion of the Makor Baruch um, is one of the portions that is translated in this work, My Uncle the Nitziv. It is a description by Rabbi Bar Halevi Epstein of his aunt, the Nitziv's first wife, Reina Batya Berlin, the daughter of Itzala of Elijah, the granddaughter of Chaim of Elijah. She comes from the family of Torah Lishma, right? That is her, that is her lineage. And she describes, and he describes how she felt and thought about her place in that world. Now, as I said before, this 
portion about her about his aunt was translated in this um, book, My Uncle Did It Sib, which caused this, um, again, the book itself caused this, the, the controversy. It seems that the controversy, Rabbi Jacob J. Um, Schachter, or J. J. Schachter had, had an article in which he guessed what it was that they were referring to that was problematic in this text. They actually think that, he thinks that it had to do with the portions about the fact that Sib read newspapers and he read newspapers on Shabbos. Okay. In fact, he in fact he reports that a Shabbos in which he didn't get the newspapers was to him like a Shabbos Chazon. Um, now, what less fewer people know is that this translation was actually heavily censored to begin with. Right? There's whole pieces of the pieces that they are translating that were left out, which include this particular passage. The passages before are in the book. The passages that are after are in the book. In the book. But this passage didn't make it into the English translation. You'll understand why in a moment. Here's what the passage, when translated, actually says. More than once I heard her complain and bemoan in sorrow and pain, in bitter mood and with bitter soul, of the pain of the bitter fate and narrow portion of women in this life, because the fulfillment of positive time-bound commandments, such as tefillin, tzitzis, sukkah, and lulav, and much, much more, had been denied them, that is, to women. Even more than this, she was she disturbed and pained by the desecration of women's honor and by their lowly status resulting from the prohibition to teach them Torah. Once she said to me that Eve, which is to say women, had been cursed with 10 curses, then this curse, the prohibition of learning Torah, was equivalent to them all and yet added on top of them, and there was no end to the pain. Hmm. Now, that is a powerful text. That is a text of a woman who clearly did feel right, that the preeminence of Talmud Torah in her world was something that felt very exclusionary to her and something she couldn't participate in and something she bemoaned. But she is the daughter of Ritzel of right? She, by the way, in other descriptions in this work, he just she would she would learn that's what she would do he would come walk into the house and she would have the table covered with svarim right covered with no gemaras right she would have mishnayos it's mishnayos is in the hebrew text didn't make it to the english right but the hebrew text records mishnayos as part of the text that she had <laughs> but it, but the absence of real learning of real being learning like they did in yeshiva was something that pained her greatly but it would not be accurate to generalize from the experience of Reina Bacha Berlin to most women living in the Lithuania. That was not their experience. Right? What was their experience? <clears throat> well, the idea of Torah Lishma certainly does impact the world of women, particularly when it came to what we might call the marriage market. Mm -hmm. right? We mentioned a moment ago that it was commonplace in Europe for a, um, a young man to go and live with his in-laws for the first few years of marriage. This was part of, a, um, of an idea that was referred to as test. Right? Test meant it was, a, it was a, a contractual obligation. It was part of the marriage arrangement is that the parents of the young woman would agree to support the young man for X number of years. And generally speaking, if we go back before the 19th century, that will often involve some sort of apprenticing and training in a trade, often the trade of the father-in-law. So you take the young kid in, you would, he would live with you, you would train them in a profession until they could go out on their own. By the early 19th century already, right, the ideal cast was not about supporting a young man so that they could learn a trade, but supporting a young man so that they could learn Torah, right? How many years would you support this young man for? Right? That was the big question, right? Now, in order to attract a young man who is capable of studying and capable of learning Torah at a high level, what did you need to do? So you needed to have money, and if you didn't, or perhaps in addition to, you would want the young woman to be able to 
support her husband. And more and more over the course of the 19th century, doing that actually meant right, that women needed to be educated, at least in basic areas of what we would call secular studies. They may need to read Russian. They may need to do basic math. And so early on already in the 19th century, the, um, the world of, of education for women begins to grow. Now, the idea that women weren't educated is not quite accurate. Right? There were chadarim for, for, for girls. There absolutely were chadarim for girls. Um, uh, chadarim for, for girls focused almost primarily on reading. Right? There was, so writing was not something that most women were, were taught, but they were certainly taught to read. Um, to the degree to which they could translate or not, we'll see a little more about that later. They only generally for go for three, four years max. Your, your wealthier families would not send a girl to Cheder. You would hire a tutor to come in and to study with your, with your girls. Um, but so what Kest will do is it will change the marriage market. It will change what we're looking for, what the ideal husband looks like. And because we're changing what the ideal husband looks like, we're changing the ideal for women as well. And think about it almost as a pyramid, right? Because you want to catch that, that Talmud Chacham up at the top, right? If you, the, the actual marriage is made to young men who could sit and learn for a long time were far fewer than the number of women who are going to be trained or prepared to potentially catch, right? Somebody who could sit and learn. So the, the number of women who are going to be given some sort of education, begin to learn right, how to navigate the world of business would far outpace the number of women who are actually supporting men who are sitting and learning. Now, this, the notion that women in Europe and particularly in Lithuania were going to go out and work actually is, is not, doesn't come around in, 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 um, uh, first in the 19th century, this, sorry. I'm going a little slow here. This comes from a, um, a traveler, a, a, I'm an English traveler who travels through the Russian lands in 1815 already, right? And uh, he has an entry for the Lithuanian Jewess. And his painting of a Lithuanian Jewess is of a woman in a store. That she's the shopkeeper. Right, not the shopkeeper and the patron, but she's running a store. Now he doesn't have such flattering things to say about the women that he encountered. He writes, they take particular pride in their headdress of pearls. In other respects, their dress seems a bundle of dirt and rags. There never was a more perfect antidote to love and the graces than a Lithuanian Jewess. They command the men and reign without control. And in case you were uh, wondering what they she's talking about, Isidore Kaufman was a uh, Austro-Hungarian um, uh, artist in the late 19th century who travels into what was the Pale of Settlement and gives us some really wonderful um, uh, paintings of the world of Eastern European Jewry. Uh, but you can see here what he's, what, what he's referring to, the pearl headdresses of Jewish women at the time. Okay. Um, this idea, though, that women were out in the workplace, that this, and, and it only becomes more so, over the course of the 19th century. It's also recorded in this um, important work, the memoirs of the Yechezkel Kotick, who is, uh, the, the work is, is, is given this title, Journal, Journey to a 19th Century Shtetl. He's from Kamenitz, and he records the following about Kamenitz. All the stores were run almost exclusively by women, older and younger wives, their daughters and daughters-in-law. The women usually sat outside opposite one another or side by side, scarcely able to hide their mutual anger and envy if one of the numerous young wives pulled or dragged in potential customers by their sleeves, mainly peasants or their women folk. The better kind of customers, the Jews or the gentry, usually patronized particular stores and nobody dragged them into one's own store like a herring. But under their breath, the women fired curses at them and the storekeepers who made a profit from them. Just note, as we, we did already at the beginning of our lecture series, right, we often have this idealized vision of the shtetl as a place where Jews had nothing to do with non-Jews. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not the case. Right? We re re recall the shtetl was a place that was built to service the peasantry, to service the non-Jewish um, population. And that was largely done by women. Now, what about the men? 
So what did the men occupy themselves with? Surely they did not hang around idly. Kamenitz was surrounded by about 200 landlords of larger and smaller estates, and each had about 200 serfs who slaved away for them day and night. The lords, of course, wanting to continue a life of pleasure and leisure, employed one or two local Jews each who did their bidding. In this way, the Jews made a living, more or less. So it's not that the husbands of all these women were sitting and learning. Some were, some may have been, right? But most of them were actually working as well. But the ideals will certainly push women and prepare them for um, a place in, uh, in the workplace. In fact, it's so much so the case that one of the ironies of the rise of Haskalah literature in the second half of the 19th century, the enlightened Jews of Eastern Europe are fighting for a Victorian image of women. They bemoan the fact that Jewish women work. They want them back in the house. The enlightened vision of Jews is to bring them back into the home. So this famous um, uh, um, poem for social Europe, we'll talk about more in just a moment, contains this line in the first paragraph next time we follow, they say, Anev and Anev. She never leaves her store, going one place to the other. You conceive, you birth, you nurse, you wean, you bake, you cook, and surely you wither. That is the fate of a, a Jewish woman, according to like, the masculine, the enlightened literature of the late 19th century, bemoaning the fact that women are out in the workplace. Let's, though, not rely on the writings of men, particularly masculine men. Let's work, get into the world of the writings of women themselves. This is an invaluable text. If you're interested in the world of women in the 19th century, there's really nothing else like it. Um, it is a memoir written by a woman in the 19th century. Her name is Pauline Bengeroff. Her um, initially known as Tesla Epstein. Um, I don't believe related to the Epsteins of Revichiel Michal, um, but also a prominent, a prominent family. Um, there are plenty of caveats to know about this text. First of all, she is part of an upper class of the Jewish world. She is, comes from a wealthy family. She is clearly educated. Um, and as you learn in reading her book, she ultimately leaves the world of traditional Judaism, not, not without tremendous pain and suffering. The last, the last chapter of her book, or one of the last, she calls... Um, as the amputation, it's when she makes her 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 um, uh, kitchen non kosher, and it is so painful for her, but she does do it. So those are the caveats behind this book, but it gives us incredible insight in the words of a woman into her world. So does everybody know the 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 chiyuv around making candles on Erev Yom Kippur? No, huh? All right, well. Let's enlighten ourselves then. Another sacred obligation was the preparation of the Yom Kippur candle. Early in the morning of Arab Yom Kippur, the old Gabada Sarah appeared. Gabada was an old woman who had voluntarily made it her life task to do good works among the sick and poor, um, and for the recently deceased. She brought a whole stack of trinis, little prayer books for women in Yiddish. She also brought an enormous ball of wick thread and a large piece of wax. My mother would eat nothing until the candle was finished so that her spirit would be softer and she would be more inclined to weep. Sarah and my mother began the work by saying many of the prayers and chinus, weeping intensely. Then Sarah put the ball of wick thread into her apron pocket and the two stood facing one another about three feet apart. They passed the thread from one to the other while my mother in a cheerful voice spoke the names of all the members of the family who had died, mentioning their good deeds. For each one, a thread was added to the wick until it was good and thick. The sacred oblig obligation, the mitzvah of making candles on Erev Yom Kippur. Mendel Melchizedek was um, uh, is known as the, fa the father of modern um, Yiddish literature. His original name was Sholem Yankov Abramovich. Um, he wrote a book, a novel that was somewhat autobiographical that he never quite published, called Shloma, um, Shloma Reb Chaimis, and he refers to something very similar. And honestly, also named Sarah, he used to read what really could, what really could faint. Right, her reading was full of feeling. Her little tune, meanwhile, touched, plucked at the soul. Even a stone would melt from her tears. It's worth adding here out of interest that at least part, at least part of the trina, she would say on Arab Yom Kippur while making the wax candles. What is the trina? 
Well, tchila itself is the is the prayer. Is the is and what 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 language is it written in? It's written in Yiddish, and it's written almost primarily for women. The question of whether it was written by women is something historians like to debate. I don't have any any dog in that fight. Right? Um, but but they were clearly meant and intended for women. So they were make this right and on Erev Yom Kippur, so Sarah places the wicks. Women neighbors with broken with broken hearts stand around her. Meanwhile, she reads reads aloud to them deep from the heart in a moving voice. Rabboni Shalolam, Master of the Universe, Merciful God, the candles which we install in Shul for the sake of your holy name and the holy pure souls shall arouse the Avos and the Imos, fathers and mothers, that they should from their graves entreat on our behalf that no evil, no troubles, no suffering should come to us and our light and our husband's light and our children's light shall not be extinguished before the time comes, God forbid. And then they would go through each one of the Avos and the Imos and they do a separate wick for each one, for Avram, they were doing for Sarah, they were doing for Yitzchak, for, um, for Yaakov, for Rivka, and all the way, all the way through. This is probably the most famous compilation of early Trinus. Um, uh, the author is referred to as a woman by the name of Sarah Bas Taivin. Right? Her father's name differs in different versions of this. And again, there's a lot of debate as to who she was and did she actually write it was perhaps a pen name of somebody else. Again, it doesn't quite interest me. What does interest me is that this was an extremely commonplace in the world of women to have either her book of Trinus, somebody else's, her, her most famous work was, um, was, was known as Shlosh Shlo Sharim or Shlosh Sharim. Right? And here in Shlosh Sharim, right, one finds um, Ibn Machlin from Yom Kippur, um, uh, sorry, Machlit from Yom Kippur, right? right? When you make the candles for Yom Kippur, this is what you, this is what you say. And you start with Rabbanu Shalom, right? And there's your, there's your text. This is a sitter published in the middle of the 19th century in Vilna, 1861. This is the cover page. This is the inside cover page, which tells you a little bit more about what this, what this, the, the audience of this particular sitter was intended for the Hahamonim, the Hanashim, Shabbat Amenu. It was intended for the, the common folk and for the women. And what do we find right after Kaparos in the Karbon Mincha Sitter? Oops, there it is, right? The trina for an Arabian kipper by the Lichmachen, right? This is the trina we say when we make, we make the candles. This is a much later compilation of trinas. And here you can see all the different parts of life and times and it's late, so I'm not gonna go through it, right? In which there were trinas to say at various occasions in life, various times in the calendar. And sure enough, there again, right? From Lichmachen, Arabian kipper, but it's just one of, one of many that you would find, and here's the, here's the trina itself. And in fact, the process, the, what is often referred to in the literature as the mitzvah of Lichtmachen, an Erev Yom Kippur, is actually part of an earlier ritual also done by women, right, which was known as Feldmestin or Knet Lachlegen, which, which refers to a process of laying out um, uh, of measuring either an entire seminary, cemetery, sorry, or particular graves. And was done by women as a way, often when somebody was sick and needed a refuah, they would go and they would do this. Right? And the, the, the thread that they would use to lay around the cemetery and the graves was the thread that they would then use on Arab Yom Kippur to make their, 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 Yom, Kippur, their Yom Kippur candles. Um, this comes from... Um, a Yitzkerbuch right? of, a, of a town. Yitzkerbuch is a, were, were compilations of memories post-Holocaust of people who were from a particular town would put it together. This comes from a particular city of Kariv right? in which one of the entries in Yitzkerbuch is about Gitla, the from a Gabata. We heard, saw that for, phrase already, the Gabata, right? Um, and it tells us about the, their minog von Mestin, right? Those base, base akvaros. This is the way they would measure the base akvaros. There's a wonderful story at the end of it where this Gabata um, um, Gitla is, so she's doing the, she's measuring the, the kvaros because there's a particular child in the town who is sick and they tried everything else, nothing else worked. So they went to measure the, the kvaros and the tchina that you would say as part of measuring the kvaros said something like, you know, just as we've pulled on this thread and it hasn't broken, 
so too you shouldn't break, right? This this young child or this person who's being sick, who's being pulled, shouldn't be broken. That's the that's the tefillah that was offered. And so the story is told here that on one unfortunate day, right, in which they were doing this for this particular child who was um, who was sick, you know what happened? The string broke. And so she, he mentions, though, that this very quick-witted Gabata immediately changed the text, right, to say that just like this string broke, so too you should break the Gazar Din that has been decreed upon this young man. <clears throat> okay, back to the world, and I know we've got to finish up, back to the world of Paulina Vengeroff, of um, Pesela Epstein. Um, we mentioned the Gabata and the, and, and the Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur candles, right? So this is a, this is a different um, ritual involving women. The next day, um, the next morning, the day began late. This is the morning after a wedding. The bride remained in her room until my mother and elder sisters brought her a simple woman named, called a galorka, right? armed with a huge pair of shears. At my mother's command, she took possession of the head of my poor sister, leaned it against her breast, and beneath her murderous shears, and remember, this is a woman who has already left the world of, of, of tradition and religion. Beneath her murderous shears, one strand after another of her beautiful hair fell from my sister's head as the Jewish custom demands. In less than 10 minutes, the sheep was shorn. She was left on, um, only a little bit of air over her forehead so she could brush it back. No trace of her own hair must show. Mm -hmm. Then she had a tight fitting silk cap with a wide silken band over her forehead, the same color as her hair. But look what happens next. We sisters of the bride covered her face with a cloth. This is after the wedding. With a cloth of white silk, and led her into the salon where the gentlemen of the house and many guests were already assembled. Whoever wanted to see her face for the first time under the cap had to give a gift to Tzedakah. So you would pay the Tzedakah and then you'd be able to lift up the veil and see the, see the bride. Even the bridegroom and the parents on both sides had to do this. Then various opinions were expressed about her change in, changed appearance and soon there was a cheerful argument in progress. This goes back this is back in the world of Mendel Marcus Klein. The same woman who led um, uh, the, the Yom Kippur making, um, candle making, he describes her as follows beforehand. His mother Sarah is a delicate, fragile woman. She has small white hands and blue veins, a devout white, pale face with thin lips. Her whole countenance is somewhat otherworldly. And as she walks, she seems to float. She is a learned woman. She knows all the tchinnis from Eretz Yisrael, as well as the Mayan Torah, and all the laws of the three mitzvahs which concern women, that is Nida, right, Chala, and Adlach, Asaner, reads the Tzena Ena, the Menor Yisrael Ma'or, and other such religious books. She shows women in shul how to pray, what to say, when to jump up for Kadosh. She also reads aloud for them and always has with her there in the women's section a lemon or some drops to revive herself or others when they faint. There was a name for this. Anybody know what it was? This woman here is referred to as a, can you read that? A Zagarka? So this is one of my favorite passages in the, in the text, and you'll see why. In the 1840s, there were among the simple folk, I should say simple folk, many women who did not know how to pray in Hebrew. Still, they felt a great need to pray on the Shabbos and especially the high holidays. And there were literate women who made a business of their learning, praying aloud for others for a small fee. Such a woman was called a Zagarka, literally a reciter. In the smaller Jewish town, there might not be such a woman. And then a man, a Zagar, had to crawl into a barrel that was put in the middle of the women's section. From the midst of this fortress, surrounded by women, he read out the prayers. As may, may be imagined, this custom often resulted in comical incidents. That barrel was an inexhaustible source of new jokes. On Yom Kippur, the Zagarka was supposed to recite the prayers in a tearful voice so as to bring the women's gallery to weeping and remorse. Now, in our community, there was a woman, the wife of the butcher, who was hard of hearing. She begged the Zagarka to pray a little louder. She'd give her an extra large liver from the shop if she would do it for her. The Zagarka answered in her weeping prayer voice, weaving her reply into the recitation, the same with the liver, the same without a liver. A moment later, the men were startled to hear the entire women's gallery sob aloud in a full voice, the same with the liver, the same without the liver. <laughs> a little while later, one of the women on her way home and met another woman just arriving at the synagogue. Where are they? What prayer are they up to? No, the prayer of the liver. <laughs> liver? Last year, we didn't say anything like that. Today, F share because it's a leap year. 
Ah, it's that you can buy the book. I, I mean, was she making it up? I don't know, but it's certainly a good story if she, if she was. All right, I want to close with this. We've seen in these various texts a whole bunch of women serving in a variety of different roles. We've seen a Gavita, a Galerica, a Feldmasterin, a Zagarka. We've seen Trinus, which are the Tvilos, right, that women would say. We've seen practices and rituals that are almost exclusively belonging to women. Or in other words, now, as you can imagine, there are academics who wanna go to town with this, right? Almost arguing that they almost had a religion of their own, that's insulting. Right? That's insulting to every Jewish woman, right, who participated in this world. I think far more accurate is to describe that the women of Eastern Europe had an independent, largely self-sufficient, pre-modern, very rich spiritual world that had very little to do either with the onset of Hasidus or the emergence of the yeshiva world. Their religious world predates both of them. Trinus long predate the world of Hasidus right? um, or the world of the, the yeshiva movement for sure. Were most women sitting around bemoaning the fact that they couldn't participate, they couldn't go into the yeshiva of Volozhina? For sure not. They, were, they had a lot in their own religious world. Right? That was very satisfying, very fulfilling for them. We look back, we, we, some of them are lost to us today. We don't see them, we don't recognize them, we don't understand something like Lichmach and Aner Yom Kippur was a critical piece of what it meant to be a woman in Eastern Europe in the 19th century. So I want to leave with the following two or three um, quick text. We mentioned that these two, the rise of the Yeshiva world and the spread of Hasidus don't deeply impact right, the world of, a, of, of, of Eastern European women because Eastern European women's religious world predates that. They have their own world and it's largely untouched well into the middle of the 19th century. So it's not a surprise then that when masculine come on the scene in, a, in the middle of the 19th century, one of the things that they're going to take aim at is the most traditional elements of society, which is often the women. Right? So we understand now why Yehuda Leib Gordon starts his poem about the Jewish woman. The whole poem is called Kotso Shalagud. It's an awful, I mean, it may be a great piece of artistic work, but it's an awful story about an aguna about a woman who, can't, who doesn't have a get and who, everything she goes through to try and get this get. And she finally, at the end of pages and paragraphs, she gets the get and the, the rabbis in the town look at it and the tip of the yud is missing. So the whole thing is possible. The whole thing is about bemoaning the plight of the Jewish woman. Women themselves though didn't quite see it that way. This is how Pauline then Garof, again, an enlightened woman, sees the different roles of men and women. Into the brains of the Russian Jewish men, modern ideas tumbled in a chaotic tumult. Suddenly, irresistibly, powerfully, the spirit of the 60s and 70s penetrated Jewish life and destroyed its character. The old ways were discarded. The old family ideas, ideals disappeared without being replaced by new ones. Remember, it was not uncommon. For the first person who could read anything other than Yiddish in a family to be the woman who could sometimes access it through Russian, perhaps even German in some families. So often those books may have made their way into the family home via the women. Says Pauline Dengroff, then comes the 60s and 70s and the guys get their hands on this stuff and they flip out. Right? They don't know what to do with it. The Jewish women of that time were deeply imbued with religion and tradition in their innermost being, so that they experienced the insult to the old ways almost as a physical injury, sustained in a battle for tradition in the most intimate circle of their families. The Jewish women who still clung to tradition with every fiber of their being wished to inculcate in their children the ethics of Jewish religion, the traditions of faith, the sacredness of Shabbos and the festivals, 
in the Hebrew language, the study of the Bible, the book of books, a work for all time and all peoples. This is from a woman who is now no longer religious. They wish to transfer all of these riches to their children in lofty and beautiful ways. In her opinion, together with the results of the enlightenment, with everything new that was brought in by Western European culture. But their entreaties, that is the women's entreaties were rejected by the men with the harsh words, the children don't need any religion. Jewish young men of that time knew nothing of constraint, constraint and measure, nor did they wish to know. In their experience, they tried to take the abrupt and dangerous leap from the lowest, I should say, rung of culture to the highest. Many demanded of their women not only agreement, but submission and the abandonment of everything that only yesterday had been sacred. The spirit of the times won the battle, and with great pain in their hearts, the weaker sex gave in. I will show in the next few chapters how this process played itself out in other families and in mine. Lastly, back to Mendel Mothersfarin. The passage we've been reading about Sara the Gabata, right, who would translate for women in shul, Right? and who led the Lichmachin on Erev Yom Kippur. So she, he describes the Tchina that was said, and the wick that was put down for Yankiv, and the wick that was put down for Shlema Amelech. And then he, he ends with the following. Go ahead and laugh at this. He's talking to other masculine of his generation, people who are reading secular Yiddish literature. Go ahead and laugh at this, he who can. Let him say, if his lips allow him, that this is foolishness. Bring here the candles. Bring here such pure soul candles. Let multiply these burning feelings, pure, sincere words, hot tears, prayers, and love of Torah, of wisdom, love of people, of a world full of people. And where does all this come from? From women, from simple Jewish wives when viewed from the outside. Looking at them in the marketplace, it seems that they are nothing, so it seems. They are oddly ignorant. May there be many such women with such feelings and such words. Thank you. Yep. My pleasure. Because um, women, the, the way they reacted, and the, um, the snogging women. Not really. Not really. 